Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to spend some time with you talking about uh, the values dividend, making what matters count, uh, and the concept of integrated value. And I think uh, since I've been in the game uh, for 30 years now on CSR and sustainability, and many of you are experts in this as well, uh, I think one of the places we have to start is just to see how far we've come. And, you know, you can go back far, uh, let's take us at least back to 1960 when corporate social responsibility started to get some structure. Uh, we had Archie Carroll introduce the pyramid of CSR, uh, also the shareholder value was starting to really be driven at that point. Uh, and then in the 1970s it was when business ethics started to come onto the agenda. 1980s we've got uh, stakeholder uh, theory coming on with Ed Freeman and I'm delighted that uh, Ed is, is here with us this week and uh, I'm sure many of you will enjoy his session. That was 1984 that that emerged, um, stakeholder theory. And then we also have uh, the environment coming onto the agenda in the 1970s, right? Earth Day, the first Earth Day was 1970. Greenpeace was founded in 1970. The first Environment and Development Conference of the United Nations was in 1972. Um, and then in the 1980s, what we saw coming along, sorry, in the 1990s, we saw uh, corporate governance coming onto the agenda. 1992, the uh, Cadbury Code, and we also saw in 1994 the triple bottom line of sustainability. By the way, if you're still using people, planet, and profit, uh, you should uh, be aware that John Elkington, who coined that term, has issued a management concept withdrawal. He said if you can do a, a product recall for a faulty product, you should be able to do a management concept recall. And he did that a few months ago in Harvard Business Review. He's recalled the concept. He says it hasn't worked. It's been uh, used and abused in all the wrong ways, and it hasn't transformed business. So that's just a little thing to notice. And then in the 2000s, uh, in the noughties, we had accountability, a lot about reporting coming onto the agenda, and of course, climate and carbon reporting starting to really come on. The question is, where are we now? We're in the decade, uh, I believe, of creating uh, different kinds of values, rethinking what value creation really means, not only for business, but for society. Of course, this doesn't come out of nowhere. We, we did find uh, the original shareholder value in 1970 with Milton Friedman, saying that the social responsibility of business is to make profits. Uh, some companies still believe that. Um, fortunately, fewer and fewer. Uh, uh, stakeholder value, I've already mentioned, 1984. Blended value, you may not have heard of, but this is uh, the concept of Jed Emerson. Uh, this is a lot around uh, impact investing and what he now calls the purpose of capital. Um, and then we, we come through to the uh, 2003 which is uh, sustainable value. And that's Stuart Hart, another great academic in the sphere, uh, saying that we need to join together the value that gets created at the bottom of the pyramid among low-income people with the value that comes from clean technology, pollution prevention, and product stewardship. And then, of course, we get Michael Porter and Mark Kramer with their creating shared value in 2011. And has anything happened since 2011. Uh, well, I'd like to suggest that the, uh, the value debate has moved on and that we now need to be grappling with a new concept or at least uh, an evolved concept which I call integrated value. Well, what is that uh, and why is it important? Why should we care about it? That's really what this presentation is about today. So let's start by asking why is it important? Uh, and to understand that, we have to take a systems perspective and say, well, where is there a lack of integration? Where are things falling apart or breaking down? And there are five areas of systemic breakdown in the world today. The first is all to do with disruption. Wherever we see natural catastrophes, market crises, uh, global health pandemics, or indeed industrial accidents, we are seeing breakdown from disruption. Uh, this is the kind of thing where we know that uh, natural catastrophes, disasters have gone up from 1980 from 200 per year to 700 per year in 2016. So this is a world getting more and more disrupted. 
The second area of systemic breakdown then is disconnection. This is the so-called digital divide. We think that we're all connected, we're not. There is still uh, four billion people who don't have access to the internet. Um, there is still two billion people who don't have a mobile phone. So there is a growing uh, gap between those who have access to technology and those who don't. The third area then of breakdown that we see in society is the area of disparity. And here again, despite so many hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty and poverty dropping to less than 10% uh, by 2015, which is great news, inequality still is going up. In fact, uh, since 1960, the gap between the rich and the poor countries has grown 135%. And even if we look within our companies, since 1965, in the US, for example, CEO to worker pay was 20 to 1. Today, it's 300 to 1. So how can we expect inequality to be going down? The fourth area of breakdown, one very familiar to us, is the area of destruction. And of course, we're looking here at the complete uh, falling apart of our ecosystems, the depletion of our natural resources, uh, whether that's uh, to do with pollution or indeed to do with resource extraction. By the way, the picture at the top, what you see there is what happens when you cut open a seabird today. That's all plastics inside the seabirds. And that's not even talking about the problem we have of microplastics. You may know, according to the Living Planet Index, since 1970, we've already lost two thirds of the vertebrate life on this planet. That's a stunning figure. I mean, if current trends continue, your children or your grandchildren will literally have no biodiversity left. So we have some serious problems here. The other area of breakdown, the final area, is really the fragmentation of the human being, discontent, whether this is to do with stress in the workplace or non-communicable diseases. In fact, how are people dying today? They're not dying from malaria or TB or HIV AIDS. 70% of people are dying from com non-communicable diseases like diabetes, like heart disease, and like strokes. And interestingly enough, those are lifestyle diseases. That depends on how we live our life and how we have our diets. And it's something that is controllable. 40% of those deaths are preventable. So all of these are systemic breakdowns. The second driver then is that our global responses are diverse but diffuse. Every one of these logos you're seeing here represents a standard that's been developed to respond to these crises, to these areas of breakdown. But imagine if you're a business and all of these codes and standards and eco-labels and everything else is coming at you. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a proliferation which is really problematic. There's no integration here. If you were to try and comply with all of these standards, you may as well go out of business because you'll just be audited from day to night. Yeah, of course, the latest one, the Sustainable Development Goals, I'm not sure whether that actually adds to the integration. Maybe we've uh, found 17 ways to bring it all together, but I'm not sure that this is represented in a very connected way. Some of them are problems, some of them are solutions, and we don't really know the connection between them. The third driver, the reason why we need integrated value, is that our economies remain weapons of mass destruction. Uh, whether you look at it from the, the perspective of the great acceleration, in terms of how resource consumption or pollution is going up, there are similar charts for social trends, or whether you look at it in terms of the donut economics model, all the red zones that you see there are either ecological boundaries of the planet that we've already exceeded, or social boundaries that we have not yet fulfilled, so people that are still living be below the threshold of human well-being. So we, we haven't really tackled the negative effects of our economies. The fourth driver then and why we need integrated values because currently our business responses lack systems thinking. Yeah, if we look at most of what we see in business, I've been fortunate enough to travel to 75 countries and work with business on this, and what we see is that it's still superficial. What businesses are tackling are the things that they can easily see and manage, but they're not getting below the surface to the more difficult things like the structural changes we need 
at an institutional level, at a policy level, even at a mindset and a values level, this is really where things have to change because it's, it's the whole capitalist system that at the moment is broken. Of course, this results in companies taking a peripheral approach where sustainability or CSR basically sits on the side. It really isn't integrated for most companies. It sits in a PR department, corporate affairs, maybe HR or its own department. But if you really look and is it integrated into finance, is it integrated into marketing and into operations and into supply chain, there are not too many companies that can say that it is. The second uh, area where we're lacking systems thinking is that it still remains linear. Uh, this is very clear from the business models of most companies today. Uh, they see this as something that they can manage their way out of. The typical ISO plan, do, check, act type of approach. Let's put a management system into place and then we can say we're doing sustainability. But actually we know the trends are getting worse and the problems are big and they're urgent and they need radical change. And that doesn't come from incremental approaches, which is the way that we're doing it at the moment. So we have to change on this as well. Of course, the linear approach is also the way we approach our economy. Most companies have not yet adopted the circular economy. And finally, we are adopting this in an atomized way. So most companies are still focused on a single issue or on their own company or even on their own industry. And unfortunately, what happens from a systems thinking perspective is when any individual part is so focused on itself and maximizing its own benefits, its own well-being, that effectively starts to operate like a cancer. And so we get sociopathic effects happening as a result of the atomized approach. So much for drivers. What then about the solution or, or the, the approach of integrated value? Well, the first uh, principle really then is that we have to acknowledge that there are these areas of systemic breakdown that we've been talking about. Uh, disruption, disconnection, disparity, destruction, and discontent. And if we start from where the system is breaking down, we've got a far better chance of succeeding in coming with solutions. In terms of the second principle, then, we have to look at uh, how integrated value sets systemic goals. If you start from the breakdown, you then say, OK, what's the systemic goal that has to come from disruption? Well, we have to have a goal that's about creating a more secure future. And secure means what? It means lowering the risk, aiding people in recovery from catastrophes. It means ensuring continuity. These are the kinds of goals that we need companies to have. Secondly, if you look at disconnection, what kind of strategic response do you want? Well, of course, you want smart solutions. You want strategic goals that are all about connecting people and things for the, for the good of society. You want to use the big data and the artificial intelligence, not just to get rid of jobs, but rather to create positive impacts. If you look then at the response to disparity, well, we want shared strategic goals. We want goals that are all about inclusion, all about equity and fairness, about creating an economy that's more accessible, more diverse, that tackles things like discrimination. And then if you want to tackle the issue of destruction, of course, you want then sustainable goals that are about coming to a circular economy. This is about making sure your products are either bio-based, biodegradable, um, or indeed are renewable themselves, going to 100% renewable energy, as we're seeing in plastics now, going to 100% bio-based, biodegradable. Uh, also, zero waste design. I've just come back from Vancouver speaking at the zero waste conference there, and it's amazing what's possible and what is happening. It's a really exciting time. Being climate positive, so not just saying we're reducing a little bit of carbon, but how do we actually become positive? How do we become so that carbon is productive, so that actually our products are absorbing carbon and we are carbon positive? And then tackling the issue of uh, discontent, we need satisfying strategic goals, which are about well-being and happiness, quality of life, and meaning in our workplace. These are the kinds of goals that will start to really change us. The third principle, then, is that integrated value innovates uh, systemic solutions. So again, if you track it through, going from disruption 
to uh, secure solutions, you're then dealing with the resilience economy. And let me bring it alive with a few examples. This is Ushahidi. It's a little startup, a tech company in Africa, in Kenya. And when the earthquake hit Haiti a few years ago, terrible disaster, they couldn't get aid to where it needed to be, partly because they didn't know where people were, they didn't know what they needed, but also because they speak Creole, and very few people in the world can understand Creole, certainly not the aid agencies. And so this little tech startup set up an app which allowed them to, if they had a mobile phone and they were trapped like this man here, to send a text to say, it was geotagged, this is where I am, this is what I need. And then they crowdsourced around the world everyone who spoke Creole to translate these messages and get them to the aid agencies. It's how we use innovation, in this case, to make us more secure. Similarly, if we look at the area of being smart, we're talking about an exponential economy. Exponential because it's about the growth in processing power that is growing still exponentially according to Moore's law. Here an example is General Electric uh, with their smart street lamps. So these are all connected and they're full of sensors. So now not only are the street lamps all monitoring traffic in real time, but they have pollution sensors as well. You can now tell in a city exactly where your most polluted areas are. And the thing I like best, you download the app and you can tell where the free parking is. So connectedness has its benefits. The innovation that we then need in making a more inclusive or a shared economy is about having access. And here, uh, a nice example is Hello Tractor. This is basically Uber for tractors. Yeah, and it's operating in Africa. If you've got a tractor and your neighbor doesn't, you sign up to the app and you share your tractor with your farming neighbors. Um, if we look at the well-being economy, I always love the example of how Unilever is using its Dove brand for the Real Beauty campaign. I don't know if you've seen this, but they had two campaigns. One was that they got an FBI sketch artist to work with women who came in and had to describe to the sketch artist behind a screen uh, what they looked like, and the sketch artist drew them. And then they got a stranger who they just met, one of the other women, to then also describe them. And so you had two portraits of the same person, and guess which one was more beautiful? It was the stranger describing you that was more beautiful. We see ourselves as more ugly than we are. Yeah, we, we have self-esteem problems. As it says here, you know, most young girls, 72%, uh, are struggling to uh, say they're feeling pressure to feel beautiful. Well, what is that? Is that what it looks like on Instagram, some celebrity? Uh, and so really questioning that. The, the other one they've uh, done is in shopping malls around the world, uh, they had uh, two doors to the shopping malls with a big sign above each door. And on the one door it said average, and the other door it said beautiful. So now you have to choose if you're going into the shop, am I feeling average today or feeling beautiful? Yeah? And you see mothers dragging their daughters through the beautiful door. Yeah? Uh, I, there was one woman who just stood and looked at it for a few minutes and then she walked away. She, she couldn't decide. Yeah? So just questioning what do we mean by beauty? This is very much part of psychological well-being, because today uh, one in ten people suffer from mental illness, yeah? some sort of anxiety or depression, and that number is going up. And then the response to uh, the destruction is, of course, having sustainable solutions in a circular economy. Uh, the example here is Wherever. It's a Dutch uh, a company that we filmed as part of a documentary. Um, and they make circular suits. In fact, I got uh, the first circular suit in the world. What does that mean? It's made from polyester, and it's a fiber that can be recycled not once, but eight times. So the suit that had five years before now has a life, a multiple life of maybe 40 or 50 years. And at the end of that life, they're working to turn that textile not into waste, but into a building material especially for reinforcing the dikes and canals in the Netherlands, which currently use tropical hardwood from Indonesia, the least sustainable thing. So working creatively, this, um, this, by the way, is the documentary. And just to give you a little pause, I'm going to show you quickly the trailer for it uh, to see uh, how we're working on circular economy. <laughs> we go to circular. The 
it's game over for the planet. It's game over for society. We don't have a choice but to do this. This is imperative for our survival. But if we really don't change our mindset, I think it will be the end of the world. We're moving from a world of 7 billion people on the planet to 9 billion. The way we exist right now on planet Earth, this biosphere is really being driven by humans who are parasites. If you look at how much plastic pollution is accumulating in the ocean, plastic is starting to accumulate in the fish that people eat. There's not a lot of stuff left. And the stuff that we've got, we've got to protect and we've got to care for and we've got to use efficiently. It's not utopia, it's necessity. I am frightened that my generation will be the first generation in the world which will leave my children and grandchildren an earth which they might never be able to fix. Whether it takes 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, it is inevitable that we will hit those limits. We will run out of resources, or the pollution will become so bad that it affects our human health and we will start to feel the impact as human beings. I think if we continue with the linear economy, we're to use a technical term, totally screwed. Okay, so this came out this year uh, on Earth Day. In fact, it's, it's widely available. Uh, you can download it uh, from Vimeo On Demand. It's doing very well. It's been well received also at the festivals around the world. So, um, but the main point of it really is to say that there are solutions. There is innovation going on and we tried to capture that. We traveled to Latin America and to Africa and in Europe really capturing those examples and saying this is possible. Um, the principle of integrated value is also about how we measure systemic benefits because there are different ways to measure and sometimes companies get stuck in only one way of measuring the value they're creating to society. Of course we get the traditional measures of economic value. This is an example from Samsung of how of course they talk about not only the profits that they've made but how they've distributed that among suppliers, how much taxes they pay, how many jobs they create. All of that is important. That's economic value that's being created and distributed but it's only one kind of value. We also need the non-financial value that's being created. And here, I'm sad to say, a lot of companies are still stuck uh, with the GRI, with the Global Reporting Initiative, when in fact the standards have moved on. So a far more systemic standard that's based on the boundary conditions of the Earth and the human uh, well-being we're trying to create is the Future Fit Benchmark. So if you're not familiar with that, look it up. But that's an important one that really tries to say there are limits and we need to really respect those also in how we track the impact we're having on society and on the earth. And then we get externality values which are also important and which very few companies do. This one is, uh, the, is, is the social value measure or the value to society measure of BASF. And what it does is measure in financial terms the impact they're having on the economy but also on society and on the environment. And it's a little bit small but you, you get the idea the, uh, the green bit is actually where they are destroying environmental value but societal value they're creating value and economic they're creating. The idea is not to trade these off but rather it gives a real honest picture of the externalities, the impact we're having on society and how much that's costing the economy and people and the planet. And so we need more companies doing this kind of exercise. Puma's uh, environmental profit and loss is another example of this. And then one that really gets ignored is intangible value. You know, there are, there's so much value that's being created that is hard to measure and we don't have traditional KPIs for this. This is linked to the idea of values, of course. This is one popular model of values based on uh, 80 countries, uh, Schwartz's theory of values. But uh, we, we need to start thinking about how do we give uh, values the respect that they deserve, yeah? 
I often say that, you know, slavery didn't, didn't get banished, didn't get banned because there was a business case for it. Yeah? There was no business case for it. In fact, it was extremely good for business. It was very profitable, slavery. It came from a place of values. Now imagine all the value that's been created to society as a result of us uh, phasing out slavery in the 1800s. Yeah? But how have we tracked that? How have we recognized that? And it's the same for many values. What this actually means is we start to come to a hierarchy of values, which is not very popular as an idea, but it means that some values are actually more important than other values. Because values that are directed only at themselves, that are kind of selfish values, um, are not the kinds of values that we need. And I'll come to that in a second. So the first insight maybe that we could take away from this uh, integrated value idea is that uh, we should be focusing our efforts on these breakthrough systemic changes, the innovations. And this links back, of course, to the areas of breakdown. So it's the five forces of fragmentation and the five counter forces of integration. And this should give us a way to work constructively going forward. And then uh, we need to draw on these synergetic values. What are synergetic values? Well, like I was starting to say, there are some values that are actually more helpful in a system than others. I mean, achievement is a kind of a value. You can be ambitious, that's a value. But if you're ambitious in a way that is harming the system that you're part of, that's not a synergetic value. That's not a value that is contributing to the good of the whole. And so we need to start thinking about this hierarchy of values. Are there some values that are good for the collaboration and for the synergy of the systems of which we are part. And so if you're a company and you're part of a city and you're destroying some of the value in the city, even if you're making great value for yourself and your shareholders and maybe even your employees, that's not good enough. You need to be positive in the value you create for the systems of which you are part. Likewise, if you're a city and you're creating great value for yourself but you're externalizing all of your impacts to China or to India, that's not good enough because those are not synergetic values. You're externalizing your impacts. So we need to draw on this idea of synergetic values. And then if we do this, I really believe that there is something which I'm calling a values dividend. If we invest in values that are synergetic in the same way that we put our efforts behind banning slavery, the value to society can be immense. And I've just put a few figures up here to give you some indication that we're not talking about small numbers here. Yeah, so if you just look at the survival values that we might call that are associated with a resilience economy, worth at least 330 billion in 2017 because that's how much value we lost from natural catastrophes. If we can actually uh, find a way to tackle that, that's the value we'll be creating, let alone the lives that will be saved. If we look at the connection values, the values of connecting people using technology and other means, uh, that has been estimated the exponential economy at 1.4 trillion by 2020. If we look at fairness as a value linked to the access or the sharing economy, again a huge opportunity, 335 billion it's estimated to be by 2025. If we look at the circular economy, uh, tackling that area of destruction, again, a massive opportunity estimated to be 4.5 trillion by 2030. And if we look at the caring values that are associated with the well-being economy, there we're estimating 3.7 trillion already in 2015. So massive value that is there to be enhanced, to be tapped into, but we need to start recognizing it that investing in values is not just something we do because it's morally the right thing to do, but actually because it creates value for society, for the economy, and indeed for the other species that share our planet. So to end off now, what do you do uh, next week when you're back in the office from this conference, you're all inspired, can you actually do anything different? And the good news is that integrated value is something you can start straight away. And I often suggest this as a way to think about steps you can take. The first thing is you have to reassess where you're at, honestly, 
not for public relations or for some report that you're going to put out there, but internally, reassess the impact that you're having. One of the great things we now have, for example, the EU has launched its environmental footprint methodology for both organizations and for products. This is a standardized methodology, very cheap to implement, and we can genuinely measure our footprint as a product or as an organization. So start to do that, of course, socially as well. Get yourself a baseline that's an honest baseline. Secondly, we need to realign. So think then about the partnerships that you have. Who are you working with? Because if there's one thing we've learned in 30 years of sustainable development, it's that we can't achieve this on our own. These are wicked problems. They're complex. They're difficult. So we need those cross-sector partnerships. Which are the NGOs or the universities or the government agencies that you could be partnering with in order to really make headway on creating integrated value? And then the third is to redefine. And this is really about your purpose. Have a little bit of introspection and look at what is it that you as an organization are really trying to achieve in this world. And don't expect people to be inspired if you say you're trying to grow or you're trying to increase sales or you're trying to have customer satisfaction. Sorry, not inspiring. Yeah, something like what Unilever has, well, maybe it is. We're going to double in size while halving our environmental footprint. We're going to help a billion people out of poverty. We're going to certify 100% of our agricultural products as sustainable. Now, that's something you could get up in the morning for. As a result, 1.7 million people apply to work at Unilever every year. It's a purpose-driven organization, and we all need to become that way. The fourth is then to redesign, and this is to start thinking about your products and your services. One thing we know is that it's far easier to get to sustainable futures if we start from design principles, yeah, rather than retrofitting the solutions. So can we have innovation in our products and services that are aligned to these great strategic goals that tackle the systemic issues. And then finally, to reform. And by reform, this is the reason it's the last one is the most difficult. We're talking here especially about the policy landscape. Can we change the rules of the game, the incentives that we have in society, the price mechanisms in the market. I mean, one of the things we desperately need now and we should all be campaigning for is a carbon price. That will change so much if we can get it through our policy makers. Yeah, so how do we change? How do we do positive lobbying? How do we make sure that we're not lobbying negatively against the policy reforms that are coming? This is what we can work on as well to change the rules of the game. So all of these things, I think, is what we can do today. So I leave you with that message. Um, make sure that you uh, make what, uh, what matters count, but also don't forget to count what matters. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>